We Mortal Coils today. Um, I hope that we are uh, doing well, wherever you are. Um, I'm Stefan, this is Bray and Trevor. We're back again uh, to talk about another uh, topic of discussion. What, what is this episode? Uh, are we, is it 27? 28, I think. 20, 28, that's it. Now, 28? older than I um, am. What is yeah. that? Four times seven? Yeah. Four, right, yeah. four times so is, yeah, uh, that, you're, you're absolutely today. correct <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it, for for those of us out there um i seem to be having some internet problems today so if there's any disconnect between our dialogue that's why uh you know just letting you know um every time uh bray and trevor speak <laughs> it's like it's it's a, a solid a solid two seconds after i know that they should have been <laughs> It's also doing this really weird thing where, like, yeah. it'll stop and then it catches you up, and but it says you, you talk really fast. Yeah, you do. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, so funny. Yeah, that's, that's what we're trying, <laughs> trying its best to like, hey, 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 come on, come on, you know. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> oh, you said seven and, times and four, you're yeah, like half a second. Glad. I mean, it, <laughs> it makes it makes things uh, easy. <laughs> but in any case, um, today. We're here to talk about authenticity. Uh, the question uh, posed might be said, are you an imposter? Um, I have no doubt that we will uh, talk some about the free will uh, discussion today. Um, but mostly we want to try and st uh, stick to um, who are you? Uh, who are you with other people? And so on. I have a list of questions and um, I'd like to put them to all three of us. Uh, this is something I've wanted to talk about for a while, but um, something about the last episode made me immediately think I, I want to talk about this next time. And I knew that it was uh, my turn to, um, to to host again. Uh, so without further ado, um, how about how about you two? Uh, we're, we're once again, it's like Bray Trevor, so I'll, I'll probably stick to that order, um, you know, on my screen. What about you, Bray? Do you do you feel like an imposter? Do you have that imposter syndrome? What do is I have imposter syndrome? syndrome? Um, so the way I understand imposter syndrome is that it's a feeling that um, it's it's multiple things, but it could really maybe be summarized in the 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 way of Bray. I'll call it because I always really do a terrible job at <laughs> these sort of things. Um, sort of like a feeling of uh, inadequacy or that you've not really quite met the mark in with regards to something. So for example, um, you could uh, land some crazy job, like dream job or uh, be put um, a really good example would be for somebody who goes from a position of, uh, I'm not going to say less significance, um, but, I'll, I'll, I'll work with it. So some uh, position of lesser significance, not in like a purely like negative way. I'm just saying like if we were rating, you know, their job performance or some uh, activity that they performed in. And then all of a sudden, very rapidly, they were thrust into a position where they were in a very significant position, um, whether th this could be like a, like a sports tournament or uh, some sort of performative art. You know, some people get famous overnight. Uh, or like I said, with the job position, you could be uh, you come upon a job opportunity very rapidly and all of a sudden you're in this position of great responsibility, but you don't feel as though you are worth this position. Uh, you Maybe you don't feel like you are ready for that position or that somebody else should be here. Um, it, it's actually way more common than I think people realize. Um and I have definitely, uh, definitely felt that way before. And it's part of what made me change my major when I was an undergrad, uh, is because I would look around <laughs> at everybody else who was doing computer science and I would go, I am not like these people <laughs> at all. Mm -hmm. Um, so I almost had like a, a little variation of imposter syndrome where like, instead of wanting to be somewhere, and recognizing that um, I was different than the other people or maybe different in this environment, I, I kind of 
changed course and I said, well, I, I, I actually don't belong here and I'm going to go somewhere else. But yeah, that's my understanding. I mean, after all, Bray, you were the smartest person in the room, right? That means you need to right, think. Right, right. I mean, after all, yeah. <laughs> yeah and then nice. I went off and all got right. a minor in philosophy. <laughs> I mean, that tells you everything you need to know. Yes. And now here I am. <laughs> Man, uh, you know, we're uh, we're banking on the podcast. You know what I mean? Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Yeah, that's yeah. a joke, people. That's a joke. God damn. But uh, yeah. what about you, Trevor? I mean, you know, yeah. big neuroscience program, you know, any any imposter feelings over there? Ooh, well, <laughs> um, well, first thing, first thing uh, I've noticed, uh, I think this is officially the day where I can say that We Mortal Coils is an all mustache uh, podcast, which is nice. Right. It's kind of a good turnout. <laughs> Finally, it's a long time coming. You know, we started small, we worked our way up. And here we are. But those who are listening are requested and required to join. Yes. You, yeah. Everyone now has to have know, a mustache. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, some sort Rise of handlebar, up. some sort of chevron, or, or Chicago revolution. style, whatever, whatever it is you got, grow it out. But um, he's, he's got like one of those coffee table books with like just different types of facial hair. He's naming <laughs> off all kind of stuff <laughs> I've never even heard of. Yeah, yeah, you get into it. You know, once you really get into it, you hmm. really do. Do you, okay? Be honest. Do you have some sort of like oil or gel product for your mustache? Yes, I, you bloody well, well do, dude. Yeah, yes. yes, I do. I don't know <laughs> why I said uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of happen. course, of course. Yeah, you realize pretty quick after a while you kind of need it, or else you get kind of a patchy mess. It's just no good. Yeah, yeah. You have a rat on your face if yeah. you if you don't. You know, yeah. it's got soup in it. We can't have this. Anyway. Not naming any names, but <laughs> everybody stares at me. <laughs> yeah anyway trevor you go ahead <laughs> yeah so authenticity well this is one of those things that's highly uh, individual of course um it's not something that we're able to break into on a uh more unitary or universal level at least not something i'm i'm presently familiar with we might be able to approach that or encounter it uh later in this uh later this morning but if we were to start on this individual level, if I were to just tell you something that I find important when we speak of authenticity, um, I have a very short story. Um, I was reading a book, a small uh, paperback little thing of, uh, of uh, Twilight of the Idols. Uh, if anyone doesn't know, that's Nietzsche, of course. But I was reading it, and I was reading this one particular aphorism. I think it's, I'm going to butcher it. Or I'm, I'm not going to remember the number, but uh, the aphorism goes like this. Uh, Even the pluckiest among us have but seldom the courage of what he really knows. And I'll say it again. Even the pluckiest among us has but seldom the courage of what he really knows. And I read that, and, and I sat there being completely unsure of what that means. I, have at, I was completely at a loss. Like, what does that mean? And it took a lot of time uh, uh, before I came to the realization, and also from a lot of searching online, but uh, to the to the feeling or the realization of, of its meaning, uh, even the pluckiest among us, even the most hardworking of us throughout this life and this time, know that they will, will never be enough. They know. They'll never reach that that place they know that they are not enough they know and that speaks a lot to me it does and if we speak about imposters or authenticity or any of those things i think it in the way that i encounter it i encounter it on that level where as i sit here in this room on this chair i know i know that i'm not enough i just know and that's just the, the state of affairs. That's the way that I encounter reality. Uh, we could talk about the inverse of that as well. We could talk about how you could be very, 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 uh, you could have everything in this world and you feel you're not worthy of it. And that's a very different way of encountering reality. And that comes to this mentioning of this being an individual uh, thing, uh, being met on an individual basis. People are quite complicated. Uh, but if you were to ask me, it's, it becomes a knowing that I am not enough. And I'm going to need, and I uh, very likely will never be. And that's, that's just the way that reality feels. 
And that's the way that I encounter authenticity. I, I might disagree a, a little. And, and so I, I wonder how much of it is cultural, right? I mean, I, I wonder, I wonder how much of that is like real, real human condition versus um, culture, yeah. right? Uh, you know, but, but we all share your feelings, Trevor. And I, I know we do. Um, you know, we, we, we come from similar enough backgrounds to where it's like, we, we have this feeling of, of it's not enough, uh, into perpetuity. I, I'm right there with you. I mean, you know, uh, I know what I have is not enough. I, I, I don't have my own dwelling yet. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's absurd, but like, excusing excusing the really big factors right um i feel like what i've done in my job isn't enough despite despite uh you know very very big concerns and very justified concerns about the the people i work for um you know they, they don't they don't expect half as much out of me and they have proven that like more more than once that they just want me to be a warm body in the room so that they can tell the state we have a teacher in that room, mm. you know, but like, why, mm. why do I feel I need to go out of my way? But you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. and I'm just trying to relate this to our dear listener. I want, I want you dear listener to as well. Tell us if you feel this feeling of inadequacy, I'm, I'm surprised, but, but, you know, um, uh, happy that Bray and Trevor both brought up this kind of inadequacy. Um, do you feel inadequate? Uh, go ahead and leave that below. So, but look, I've got these hmm. questions that definitely go along with it. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people say that life has changed, right? And um, that's what we're really here to talk about today. How do, how do you change? Um, Maybe maybe that's how we escape this feeling of inadequacy. We change often enough to where we we're, we're ahead of that feeling, kind of thing, like it's chasing us. But uh, here's some questions I want to put to you guys, and I want you to uh, tell me which one um, jumps out at you. Who are you with with different people? Do you feel like you change with others? Is it always positive this change? Uh, who are you alone? And can you can you choose who you are in any of these groups? Can you choose who you are whenever you are with others, with different groups of others, and when you're alone? Um, I think we should save that one for last, the can you choose question. Mm. But uh, what do you guys think? Cool. <laughs> uh... I think the one that makes the mo or I mean the order that you present them is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I'll I'll start with uh, or yeah, I'll start with you know addressing the question on my own. I mean, you know, um, so this is one of those weird topics, right? Actually, hang on, hang on. Let me in in. You know what I think we should do yeah. is we should do who are you alone first because then we can put bare the truth and then go to who are you with other people that way yeah. you can say well i dial back a little bit on the uh you know yeah, yada, yeah. yada 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 or whatever or something like that but yeah i'll, I'll still go i'll still go first um sure you know so like I, I wanted to i wanted to make mention early on that one of the big reasons i wanted to talk about this topic uh is psychologically speaking we are all we are all different people depending on who we're hanging out with there's nothing you can do about it type of thing um there are some people as i'm sure you know listener who are like chameleons they will they will get into whatever group they're in they will change a lot of their behaviors and personality depending on the people they're surrounded by i know you know people like that but then there, there are also people out there who, who don't. Um, I consider myself one who, who doesn't a lot. But that's the thing. I, I could be wrong. Um, 
So to address the question, who am I alone? Well, you know, Stefan is a, is a person who, who requires alone time and, you know, needs it, uh, you know, with, with my own thoughts, I'm an author. Uh, I teach myself. I'm a teacher, you know, that's one of the best ways to learn. I'm, I'm certain, you know, I've said that before, uh, you, you teach yourself concepts and, you know, you try and, uh, figure it out. Um, meditative and introspective, uh, are two words I would definitely ascribe to myself especially alone. Um, I'm always trying to understand why it is I have the emotions that I do. And, and, and it's a, it's a ceaseless, um, behavior of mine. It's like, I can't turn it off. And, uh, that's awfully neurotic, by the way, I'm not advocating anyone do this. <laughs> I'm <laughs> saying, I'm saying it's just what I do. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's of course, strange to talk about it in such an objective manner as though I could be objective. You can't, but I can try. <laughs> and um, what I'm ultimately trying to say is that I seriously feel as though I do not change a lot about myself when we get with others. And we'll talk about that more later. But that's how I would answer that question. Who am I alone? Introspective, meditative, um, you know, and creative. Well, um, encountering this, uh, trying to engage with this particular question, uh, that mm -hmm. is like, who are you when you are alone? Well, this is a, this is a complicated question, uh, because, uh, well, uh, to start off, um, there are many things that you engage with when you are alone, uh, that to such a degree that this becomes quite complicated. And this is what I mean by that. I mean, Quite literally, the entire universe, uh, before you access it, uh, is at first, an, uh, well, is first and primarily uh, uh, an abstraction within, your, within a mind state, within you. It's all deeply yours in that sense. It's all deeply yours. Uh, like, for example, just last night, I had a conversation with uh, someone in a physics class about uh, quantum entanglement. I didn't understand at all, but it was still very interesting. And the way that um, he explained what quantum entanglement means, he tells the story about these two like particles and they moved over here and there and uh, all this thing. I won't get into that, but I will say that my understanding of what quantum, what quantum entanglement is as a outside of me uh, thing is accessible to me as my knowledge of what it is, uh, of my experience of it. It's all my experiential knowledge. It's all a uh, concept that exists with, deeply within me. So why did I say that? I mean to say that when we encounter uh, the questions like, who are you when you are alone? Um, it, in a sense, you could try to amalgamate a, a sense of what your ego self is, of what, tr what I think Trevor is, how I want to be seen, how I want to uh, uh, be known, uh, things that I have built scaffolded of myself. I could do that. And it, it would be useful. It would. It would, it would illuminate to you how I want to be uh, seen, as well as how I think I am, those sorts of things. I'm glad you said it that way. Yes. Um, but there's another aspect of this that I think is really quite important in this regard. Um, when, when someone asks you, me the question, or somebody asks you the question, who are you when you were alone? I do truly mean it when I say that you are the entire universe. You're everything in that sense. You are the... It's, it's a bit like uh, there's an ontological reality, that is to say, reality as a matter of fact, whether or not you're present. The trees fall, uh, sound gives off, the universe moves, all of this. And then inside of, uh, to access that ontological reality, you have your epistemic, you have epistemic reality, that is to say, knowledge reality, your interaction with it. It's, it's a bit like barriers where you have, on, you have the ontological reality, and you have the epistemic reality that you yourself access. You have nothing except for your epistemic reality. It's like a bed sheet uh, between you and the world. You're like wearing a ghost outfit from Charlie Brown. Uh, you're given rocks, but you can't touch the rocks. They, they land on your bed sheet hand. And that's, that's all you have. <laughs> and so when you, you're asked the question, uh, what, who are you when you were alone? I mean to bring all this up to say that it, it is quite everything. 
like it is uh, whenever you're having arguments with something, something that you find really quite reprehensible in your own mind, that is also you. That is, in fact, an aspect of your reality, of you, who you are, as well as the person who's uh, your mental interlocutor, your adversary, as well as the person that's currently fighting against them uh, in your own mind. That's also you, as well as your abstraction of your father. Uh, your everything you access about your father is in itself a a a, a twin glass reflection, uh, a a piece of your own self, a shard of your own mind. All of it is. Um, if you sit. Or your mother, well, especially yeah. your mother, especially yeah. your mother. Uh, all of these things are yours. All of them are. So when you're asked the question, who are you when you are alone? I, I do mean to say, all of it is you. All of it is. It's all perfectly part of who you are. Uh, and the rest of it is a, 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 what comes after that is then an amalgamation, uh, something that you use uh, in order to, uh, a bit like Legos or something or scaffolding. Uh, build a sense of ego, something you could use to then encounter reality and something that you enjoy to do, uh, something that's fun. And uh, I think I'll probably just leave it there. I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I, cause I, I would like, I would like, uh, you know, in, in a way to push the conversation uh, a bit, but I should also suggest, right. That, uh, when, when I'm alone, you know, I'm, I'm deviant and, you know, I'm disgusting and, and, you know, mm -hmm. this, that, and the other, right. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. like everyone is. And it's like, I, I think one of the markers of adulthood is whenever you re recognize that everyone around you is equally like, like you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, uh, foolish when they're alone. Yes. So what do you think, Bray? Um, I, I agree because I, I was literally about to say, if you didn't say it just then, I was quite literally about to go right into that and be like, Good. well, I'm, a, I'm a crackhead. I'm a swashbuckling little goblin that runs around. Yes. All cra I, I'm, I don't know if you guys have seen the wizard of that or the wizard, the video of that little dude who like <laughs> turns into a wizard and like runs around and like, he runs around like convenience stores. Yeah. And stuff. Like, it's That's so, quite literally. <laughs> It, it's no. so bad. I want him in cuffs, but it's so <laughs> funny. Like you know, yeah. he's he's harassing people, but it's right. so hilarious. It's, that's that's live footage of me running around the house when nobody's around. Um, mm. Anyways, yeah, I, who I am when I'm alone, um, I think has always been the same, relatively the same uh, strand, the same weave as I've been living. Um, however, how I behave as a conjunction of these two sort of personalities of who I am, you know, alone or introspectively versus, uh, who I am in public in these different facets of, you know, and pockets of society, I think those have started to, uh, become more interwoven over time. Um, Integrated. right. Uh, yeah, and I and I have uh, the university environment to thank for that, but also um, because I started caring about the things that I believed in and sort of the path that I wanted my life to take. Um, you know, my favorite quote, uh, it used to be on the philosophy discord, uh, was uh, to find yourself, think for yourself. And that kind mm -hmm. of remains my favorite. That's a good one. Quote by a philosopher uh to this day uh and so yeah i'm very unapologetically myself and i i i definitely have sort of this different um aura so to speak uh when i'm in a social sphere and i do have different ones for different groups i'll be the first person to admit that um because it is beneficial to behave differently around different people now am i saying that i'm going to go off and do something like reprehensible like lie about something or or you know try to put forth some particular um uh narrative yeah that just isn't true no I, I i don't go that far but i do behave differently around different groups of people um and sometimes I really do it uh, subconsciously and I don't even really notice unless I, I catch myself. Um, but 
but yeah, uh, I'm very happy that my sort of being has become, as you said, more integrated. Uh, I really have enjoyed the person that I am becoming and, and have grown to be in my outlook on life in general. Uh, so, and again, I have the university environment and philosophy and, and hella books that I've been reading to thank for that sort of thing. So again, don't cheat yourself by not thinking for yourself. Well, so that, that brings up a, a nice, like circle back opportunity, you know, a, a nice side question on that. Are we always becoming someone else? You know, I, I certainly think so. I think I think that with time it's not possible to to not be be changing. Mm -hmm. Right. And um one of the questions I have is, is it always positive? I mean, the answer is no, of course not. <laughs> but like, you know, I, I want to explore that question as you guys understand. Uh right. you know, listener, we we all know someone that Bray has described. Uh I mean, the reason why Bray brought it up is because he almost certainly knows someone who he has seen lie, uh, you know, and construct this narrative about their personage and, and, and like their personhood. That's just a complete, I mean, farce, uh, you know, I, I've seen it. Um, so I, hmm. I know it's at least likely you guys have seen it too. Uh, a, a funny, a funny story with that, just real quick. I actually had a roommate in college, right? And this dude, you know, swore up and down that he was a big deal in Russia. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 he was a rapper. <laughs> and like, like, All right. he asked me, do you mind if I if I do the, the rapping like in the room? I said, not at all, bud. <laughs> you know, and, and, and sure in enough, he, he did it once, one time while I was in the room. And I recorded his ass. You best believe I recorded his ass. It was that bad. It, people, it was that bad. And uh, he just he just had this habitual liar state. And he dropped out, like, after actually three weeks. Uh, you know, I mean, it was it was the dumbest shit I've ever yeah. seen. <laughs> you know? And I was oh, like, no. dude, if you were just well integrated, you probably could have done something cool. Mm -hmm. But you're not <laughs> right it was it was surreal I, I mean like i didn't he dropped off the face of the earth after that like three oh weeks my ago. god i remember you telling uh the uh, yeah. story back in the day wow yeah i mean it was it was just strange and it was like you know i asked i asked around the philosophy club mm. why, why do people lie and then i mm. gave my i gave my answer i said in a predatory way because they feel they can get away with it there's they feel like they a, can get away with it, yeah. It, yeah, um, there's like this bully behavior it, well ingrained within us that's like, you know, just lie. Just do it. Uh, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, so a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, we like to say narrative so often, but I think I'll say it again, narrative. Uh, I think it yeah. has to do with um, a need uh, to, to um, support the overarching narrative. You have an idea of yourself. You do. Uh, you have an idea of your ego, and you hold on pretty tightly onto it some people uh, very very seriously or some people uh, it's some it's people we hold on to our ego pretty tightly and i don't whenever it comes time it's very easy to make small little white lies little sacrifices in support of of this ego there there are it happens all the time such as um this is where it gets quite complicated I could like I could be an ideologue, uh, someone who believes very strongly in the uh, righteous nature of the United States or in the righteous nature of uh, the CCP. But at the exact same time, there are in fact counterfactuals all at once. Uh, there are also horrible atrocities committed by both countries in this example, and I have to exist with both of those two states in mind. I have to either I have to do something. And for some people, um, you can make small concessions, which lead to larger ones. And then eventually you find yourself making conclusions that are completely uh, against what is both A, um, received to you, all this information, as well as the, the narratives of all the people around you. It's, it, it doesn't fit. It doesn't jive. It's, 
would it be strange here's a question for you Stephen. would it have been strange uh would you consider it possible uh that your own life would have changed your perspective of this uh, uh dorm mate roommate of yours would have changed if he had like seven or eight friends or seven or eight if you had seven or eight mutual friends all of which also insisted that he is a pretty fucking big deal in in russia you know uh, if they spoke about of him in this way uh would would that have impacted uh, your understanding of him who he is yeah and that raises the question of authenticity and 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 what exactly do we mean by imposter and it becomes a point of uh a sort of information campaign, a way of engaging with ideas between others and and trying to coalesce ideas between a multitude of people. And you realize that if there are eight of people versus just you, it becomes more likely that you're willing to concede information. After all, I've never been to Russia. How do you know, apes together strong, <clears throat> right? Right. Yeah, yeah you know, exactly. Yeah. Another place we, we, you know, Trevor talked about narrative and then... Um... Stephen, you mentioned first the, uh, you know, why do people lie? Because, you know, just because they can. I think it should definitely be mentioned that people also lie out of fear. Yes. And and not like, ah, you know, fear, like simple fear, like the most base fear of that acceptance. there can be for being such as ourselves, for acceptance, for fear. belonging. Mm. Trembling. <clears throat> for, for that FOMO you know yep. uh <laughs> it's like you know, the, the greatest lie ever told next to terms of service is uh mm. have you ever seen xyz and people go oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, of course and yeah. yeah. it's vague you know agreement from there on but but people people will lie um for for acceptance and it's uh it's stuff like this that i i whenever trevor mentioned oh and you have eight friends that are all like yeah he's he's the shit uh i don't know if you guys have ever seen the, these videos where they uh they doll somebody up you know all fancy and then have them go walk out in the street followed by like a dozen people with cameras and like suits just with like sunglasses and like you know private security detail and yeah. these are just normal people like that all got together and said we're gonna do this and uh it's just because act. they've yeah, it's a complete act just to put on the appearance of somebody important, um, which they are, in fact, nobody that anybody could recognize yet. They still have plenty of instances of people in the street who are like, oh, my God, oh, my God, can I get a picture? Can you whatever? And uh, they ask the people afterward, they're like, do you know who that is? And they're like, oh, I think I saw him in a movie once or something. Oh, and it's yeah. like That's it's funny. just pure sense of like, oh, my gosh, this could be happening like somebody famous. I could have crossed paths with and I, I got to speak to or I took a picture with don't even know who they are like it's it's this need to be like so attached to whatever you know grasping on to whatever you can uh, latch on to when it comes to this sort of thing uh, you know people just straight up BS you know yeah. like yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean and, and what's unfortunate right and I'm going to answer Trevor's question here in a moment What's unfortunate to me is that, for example, I work in a building where I know people are BSing their way <laughs> through their entire life. I mean, like, you know, they, they, they say they're qualified, you know, I mean, and, and the records show that they're qualified. But I mean, just because you went to a college to teach or whatever doesn't mean that you're a good teacher, you know, and I'm like, you're seriously BSing your way through your entire career. I mean, you know, and, <laughs> I mean but it's a successful strategy. And I, yeah. mean, I, I would dare say that Trump, for example, is BSing his way through the oh. entire. Oh, thing. absolutely. And, 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 and so is Biden, and and so are a lot of the other ones it, as well. Well, Trump has a track record of BSing his way yeah, that's through why it's so numerous bins, business ventures. <laughs> that's why it's so easy to bring him up because we have him on camera lying about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, the facts. Don't don't get me wrong. Once again, that, that would be like saying uh, Biden's never lied on camera. Of course he oh, has. Oh sure. I, I mean, my goodness. But uh, I want to answer Trevor's question, right? I want to answer it with a particular reply would my opinion change or, or or my thoughts change if he had eight friends all following him around in suits and and, and 
Shade. Almost. Almost. Uh, yeah. Eight mutual friends. Eight people that you know are friends with and respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Eight mutual friends. So here's the deal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reply to this in a very particular way. The answer is yes, of course. My opinion would have changed back then. Mm. Um, I was not wise enough. I, I was not gullible. I mean, I, I was not um, uh, as incredulous as I needed to be. You know, back then I'd have been like, okay, you <laughs> big shit in Russia. But still, then a common thread of my personality would have been, so what? <laughs> you know what I mean, like we don't we don't <laughs> live there. You know what I mean? And uh, okay, so my second reply to that is nowadays, I would have absolutely had not the same opinion, but I wouldn't have believed anything that he said anyway, because I'm such a trained scientist nowadays, where it's like you must show me the data if you if you want to claim the the big claim that you're you know a big deal in russia then you you have to show me <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean like that's what i'm trying to say is that uh, i want i want to talk a little bit about what bray said as well that university experience i mean you know i, I think it's highly overrated <laughs> but it it did get there me out of a cult. A... I mean, you know, it, yeah, it does its thing. It did it did do a lot for me, and I I mm -hmm. wouldn't trade it for anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the big big things it did for me was I had to teach myself, at, you know, with help of others. Do not misunderstand me. How to be a good scientist? How how to vet claims? How to how to how to navigate anybody trying to BS me? You mm -hmm. know, and um, as a quick aside um narcissists hate authentic people hate them and and that's why that's why you know every time i've encountered a narcissist i've been able to spot them because i was raised with them and mm -hmm. uh i've always been able to feel their disdain for me like like i see through the lie I, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know uh i don't know it's it's interesting to me how, how all that works out i hope that's an adequate reply for you trevor it is it is seriously mm. but so let, let's talk about this i mean real quick I, I mean you know uh if it if it's quick if it's not whatever but i, I want to go back to that feeling of inadequacy you both brought up because i think that's really important and becoming someone new I, I really feel like we're always becoming someone and we're always like trying to catch up to the person we're trying to become mm. right is it always positive? And let me rephrase that question a little bit, because of course the obvious answer to that question is no. We all know uh, uh, a prison uncle or or a, a drug head that was <laughs> not at once a drug head in their childhood. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, obviously, those are not positive things. Um, let, let's let's rephrase the question as like, if you have a positive change in life. Is it a hundred percent positive? Is it possible to have a hundred percent positive change in your life? Mm. Well, this is this is a very difficult question. Uh, so, so whenever you, I'll first start with change and staying the same. We'll start there. When you see change in your life. <laughs> or just see a, a concept and collect it in your mind. Uh, you aggregate a, a certain sentiment in this moment. Uh, you have a way of falling into it, falling and then falling and then falling, uh, where you see change and then or, or change rising and, and rising. change. However you want to uh, visualize it, it's, yeah. it's a cascading effect. It's a, it's a growing and growing and growing, leaves on leaves on leaves, kind of like that uh, effect in physics that uh, looks, that. I forget what it's called. Maybe it's the Mandelbrot set where you see the uh, like a leaf growing out like this or, or a fern growing out like this and then like an infinite regression where it just goes and then goes and then goes and goes and it looks a bit like any a fractal fern. pattern. Fractal yeah. patterns, yeah. So what you do in this moment, uh, at this exact moment, when, it's, when I speak of change, 
is you look into it and you see all throughout your life, all throughout all of the universe, as far as you are concerned, uh, change, all of change and your feeling of change. And if you are currently in a state of feeling change, feeling as if everything has changed, why, why did it change? Uh, you, you see everything fundamentally as change. All you see is change. You're, you're, in, a, you're in a state of putting on and then putting on and then putting on a pair of uh, rose tinted glasses where all of reality is visualized in terms of change. And the same thing could be said of stability or, uh, or sameness where, oh my God, everything's the same. Nothing ever changes. Nothing ever changes. Nothing and then ever you just, happens. Nothing ever happens. That's an aspect. <laughs> it is. Where, where you look around and all you see is the fact that nothing changes. Nothing changes. And then you fall and you, then you fall and you fall into this sentiment. Uh, so why do I say this? Uh, I mean to say that you could apply this to this particular question. Uh, it, all of reality becomes a sort of uh, falling into uh, a particular uh, narrative or a particular uh, concept where you fall and then you fall and then you fall into it. And, and then you, when you are finished with that one state of being, you then pick yourself up again and you begin the next. It's, it's, a, it's a cycle, uh, constant and, and non-ending. And that's one way, it's, it's up to you, truly, but that's one way of visualizing reality. Uh, there are many ways you can do so, but I, I mean to bring this to your attention, that if you wanted to, you could see everything that happens to you today. And I'm speaking to both you, Prey, and, uh, and uh, Stefan. Sorry, I almost said Steve. I, yeah, you're good, you're good. Yeah. And the <laughs> listener. Yeah, well, and the listener. Uh, you could see reality according to these means where you could fall and then fall and then fall and then reset again and fall and fall and fall. So I could get worried and worried and worried and then anxious and anxious and anxious about this, that, and the other thing. And then I can begin again, like uh, suddenly a reset of my own mind, the, the essential character of my own qualia of my experience will click and then I'll move on to something else. You could, re you could visualize reality according to those means if you wanted to. And I think that characterizes this particular question. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I appreciate, um, I appreciate all that you say, Trevor. You know what I mean. But some sometimes I feel like it's uh, awfully solipsistic. You know what I mean. And, it and certainly we'll, we'll is. come back to that later. You know, I want to <laughs> yeah. I want to hear what Bray has to say about is it possible to have a hundred percent like good or desirable change in life? Every every chain is there ever a change that <clears throat> doesn't come with some baggage? Uh, yeah. And like you said, I think the, the, the sort of obvious answer is no, but I, I think we wonder why, why can't we make a, a change in our life? That's a hundred percent good or, or to frame it, um, more in the sense of authenticity and the realm of, of today's topic. Um, why can't we make a change that is like 100%, uh, authentic, uh, there you go. even, yeah. Um, so, so what I, what I visualize, uh, in this sense is like, and there's a number of different ways that you can sort of illustrate this and I'll just choose one, but like, we're all on this track. We're all quite literally uh, on a rock flying through space at ungodly speeds. But, um, you know, there's this sort of conception in your mind that I think, uh, intuitively people, um, are aware of, of like what you want out of your life. Um, and this would be a good point for me to mention that like that university experience we've touched on so much already listener is something that helped clarify what that was in my life. Um, and the reason that there was room for so much clarification is because there are constantly external forces, um, being thrust upon you in your life. At play. Uh, yes. Uh, you, are, you are constantly being observed and being forced to participate in a society. <laughs> um, and I don't just mean where you live. I mean, as the whole human structure on the planet as a whole. Uh, yeah, the, even the you social the most, aspect. Right. Mm -hmm. The most primitive aspect the fact that you need to eat and drink and sleep and uh, numerous other things in order to even stay conscious and living. Um, but all of that aside, you have this sort of conception of what you want, what you truly desire out of life, but it's way far 
off in the field somewhere uh and there's multiple different paths that lead none of them directly to this this goal um but all the all the paths are on a treadmill right <laughs> because they <laughs> yeah. they were constantly uh you like, know is there a trolley right yeah <laughs> and then all of a sudden a boulder comes around. no but what I, what i'm really trying to say is that um if this was in like a vacuum and there was no no external factors it would be very easy for us to objectively say oh well, here you need to uh take this path or if this was you know if life was a game of chess purely we could objectively say here's a move that's 100 percent the best move that you can make right here uh, in order to achieve this goal uh, but it's not that way things are constantly changing the only thing that is absolute is change that's the only one of true objective truth is that thing will change, whatever that quote is um I, I would rather i'd rather just bring up the laws of entropy uh you know you cannot yeah. do anything about them yeah exactly um and so the decisions that you make in face of these external factors uh in face of what we might call in existential philosophy the other uh the decisions that you make in face of all of that on this path of life uh towards what you want is what we're talking about when we talk about authenticity um if you can in defiance of these external pressures whether that be you know your parents your peers um figures of authority in whatever ways those appear to you um even uh advertisements the decision to or not to buy a particular product these are all things that affect how you act and therefore how you be or not be in or authentic um so so yeah is there is it possible to make a you know i i would hate to try to quantify the ability to make an authentic decision but um that's my piece on just elaborating on how really we can't do such a thing i think the fundamental issue that i think uh we should touch on here when it comes to the question how like you know change are you are you becoming who you are uh, that sort of thing are are you actually are you an imposter i mean it all kind of reflects to the same question mm -hmm. and i think all of it all of it requires a, a presupposing question that needs to be answered first who are you exactly who are you and when you uh, chew on this question we should right now we should but when i think of this question i, I usually my short answer is i don't know i don't know who i am uh the uh what would you call that the harbinger of my own mind is is myself and, and my own decision making and all that sort of thing and I, and, I, and i'm the one that derives uh, the direction of my life and the one and i'm the one that conceives of uh whether or not i miss the mark uh, I'm, i do all those right, things right but i so, so but... Real, real quick trevor real quick i i'm i'm 100 on board but i want to i want to table that for the for the can you choose can you choose who you are you know what I mean? Mm, okay. So, so, so let let me let me ask you a direct question, right? Because, um, like I say, I really want to revisit that, but like for now, mm -hmm. I want to ask like, uh, which is more which is more advantageous, right? In, in your opinion, because this is just an opinion question, which is more advantageous to be like a really authentic person who doesn't change a bunch between people? or to be that chameleon person that I talk about that that does change a lot depending who they're with uh i don't hmm. <laughs> well the question itself uh relies on the fact that there's some sort of authentic self that that does exist whether or not you're there and you're being false to it whenever it's comes yeah. a time whenever this happens but I, I don't know if I agree with that essential, uh, that presupposing claim. I, I'm not so sure that there is such a thing as a um, cohesive self that stays in one place that I can rely back upon, or or the very least, it can remain consistent. That I and I can remain consistent to it as it changes. We can uh, we can rephrase if if you like uh, to to put it into a way that Trevor Trevor speaks would put it right. <laughs> you know, fair. all right, fair enough. Would it would it be more advantageous? for a person to change 
fifty percent of their behaviors with other people, as opposed to forty nine. A difference. Ah, well, I see what you're. I see what you're saying. Um, the issue is in this particular moment, as I speak to you, you and also Bray. Um, I don't particularly know what I am. So I, it's very difficult for me to take those choices of, of, of percentages of this and that. All I can do is just behave with you in this moment. This is quite a complicated question because I do know exactly what you're getting at. And I do believe that there's validity there because there's, there are in fact moments in my life where I do feel as if I'm being inauthentic to myself. Uh, certainly so, certainly so. Uh, there are moments in conversations uh, I'm sure everyone has had where they feel as if as the conversation ends and they're walking home, like, why did I do that? Who yeah, was why that the fuck there? did I do that? <laughs> yeah, who, who, is, who is in that conversation? Why, why did I say that? You know, we, we all feel this. And we all feel that sentiment, that feeling that we were being inauthentic to ourselves and, and to all those other people as well. We feel that sentiment, we do. And, and that lends credence to the, uh, to the idea that there is, in fact, a cohesive self that we are being un inauthentic to at that moment. But I can't quite pinpoint, I can't quite target what exactly that authentic person is, what that cohesive self is. I can, I can say what that person isn't. It, what, it was not that person at that moment in that conversation. I, I, that's, that's useful. It is. But I still don't know and I still can't pinpoint what the cohesive self is. I can I can say what it isn't, but I can't say what it is. It's it's really quite uh, difficult, and the cohesiveness of it. I say cohesive, but uh, once again, we talk about change. Even the self, it's uh, even the self itself is itself change. It, it's all non cohesive. And if, and if you want to, we come back, now. I'm coming back to the whole idea of of, of that one solipsistic way of visualizing reality of falling and falling and falling. Um, I could just realize that at this moment, when I'm trying to locate myself and locate the self, what I'm doing is constantly looking and then looking and then looking in this one state of uh, state of mind, which is itself. <sighs> this is one of those precipice moments where I'm just not sure where to go because it really is an abyss. I, I really can't locate the self. I I really cannot. I've I well, I've I've got something perhaps related. So I was thinking about this as as Trevor was mentioning, sort of the idea that he's like, I don't know who I am, right? Um, uh, and so it got me thinking about um about the uh, the the gender discussion that we had. Uh, and I was, I was how, hoping you'd bring up. I was hoping you'd bring up LGBT issues. I really was. Yeah. Um. And now uh, that and there's a whole other angle to work with just that um but the reason i bring it up is because of the um judith butler's um uh points about uh gender being sort of a, a oh man i don't i don't want to butcher this again it, it's it's sort of like gender is a practice it's something that you do yeah constantly almost like a skill um, right and um it, you know things are always always changing and you always have to keep putting up this sort of um they might not appreciate my use of the word performance but um you you're almost always putting on this performance and it's not just for the gender it's with many different things um which is why i i bring this up is because it's the same thing i think with being an authentic being is that you are always putting on some sort of performance because like i said the landscape is always changing um therefore you are not the person you were yesterday two weeks ago or a year ago um and what that means is that uh you know i i can't necessarily i i may never reach the point of some sort of authentic self that we're, we're trying to pin down or whatever it may, it, maybe it's like you know it keeps narrowly escaping every time we try to pin it somewhere right but what i can do is make decisions as if I were already there. You know, I can make decisions as if, you know, if tomorrow I decided, well, I want to be a whatever, like I want to be a heart surgeon or something, or I want to be a, I don't know, I want to be a pirate. I want to be a little, you know, sailing the seven seas, plundering all the loot, whatever. Tomorrow I could wake up and start making decisions as if that was actually who I am, <laughs> even though 
it, well, for me, it, it's absolutely the truth. But for, for somebody else, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? You can make decisions as if you are already in a position, even though you are not there yet, because the truth is you will really probably never be able to reach that point. Too much is just changing all it, the time. It's almost like, Ray, I'm, I'm happy you put it that, that way. And maybe this will help um, focus the point. It, it's almost as though you're always talking to your future self. Right. Mm, and right. we have a lot of evidence for that because, you know, that's kind of I mean, it's not 100 percent where our consciousness comes from or anything. But like a, a lot of our intellect comes from ancient man being able to say, OK, future Stefan has to eat as well. So mm -hmm. I better store some food for future Stefan. Right. Like, you know what I mean? It's all right. Um. If I could say one thing about the self here, I, I just had a thought. I, I don't, I, I think one way to identify the self, uh, since we're talking, like, we're really getting to the ether of what the self is, and you start to, like, connect to, like, uh, like you've tried to, like, shred as much away from it as you can. You It kind of comes to the feeling of the self is what is currently making this noise that you two, that you, that you two are listening to. When I, it's, it's my ego state, that sort of thing. It's all kind of coalescing underneath that. The ego is so much more, but it's it's that at this moment. That's the spearhead of it. And since it is fundamentally what I am, I can't quite identify it. It's a bit like a painting looking at itself. It's not something it's capable of doing. But what I can do, talking about the future, uh, what I can do is look to the past and see the uh, stories it has left behind, the uh, channels it has is, it is driven into the ground, and then use that as a um, as an intuitive, an intuitive point uh, to which I can then express what the self is at this moment. That is to say that I can remember stories such as uh, when me and a whole bunch of other asshole friends made a snowman once at a park and then uh, got into a and then, you know, ran around for a day and then lost our minds on uh, all sorts of things. You know, I can remember these sort of stories. I can. I can go into it and remember this and then that. And then when this person died and then and then my own uh, this and this and this, I, I can. I can look into those stories and create an intuitive point, a pivoting point to which I can then approach questions such as authenticity. I can try to engage a particular context against what my intuition of what I am is against it, and then use that to create a uh, present moment and a future that will look, that will coalesce with my abstraction of what I am. Uh, that's what I'm doing at this present moment when I'm trying to engage with you. I'm trying to create further pasthood. I'm trying to create further past moments that themselves coalesce with my overall narrative, my overarching uh, story of myself. Uh, what's scary that, that about is, all that of this is to say, is, as, you know, just to make sure that the listener isn't lost in the weeds there, uh, you're suggesting that it's all based on interaction. Yes, that, it's all based. Yeah. It's what, what the self is, is a bit like a clear, open, uh, uh, force that you're completely incapable of seeing. But you can't see the impact it leaves behind. You can see the channels that it makes into the ground as it moves in. It's like a, it's like a, a creature that's constantly turning around the other angle of a hall. Like a, imagine a hallway that's like bends like this, and you're and you're following after someone's shadow, trying to get up to them. But they're always just a little bit ahead of you. So all you see is just the curve, is the slightest curve of their shadow. You're walking after them. That is the self. And you come to a horrible realization that the shadow that you're seeing is only your own uh, shadow from the other side of the hall in some strange, miraculous nature. And that's why you never catch up to the self. It looks like, like a hallway full of mirrors type thing. Exactly, exactly. The yeah. shadow that you were curving around to meet uh, that person ahead of you was always just yourself. And that's perfectly why you're not capable of seeing it. And that's probably the best analogy of understanding what the self is, I think. And, and the rest of it, uh, as I mean, you the try way, to walk... The way the Bible puts it, Trevor... Please. Is you know whenever Moses went up the mountain, mm. you know he uh, he came back down, you know saying I've seen the face of God. You know what I mean? And yes, and that if uh, you know, but but like, well, not excuse me, actually not the face of God. He had seen the backside of God. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, and his face was shining like the backside of God. And like you know, it came up somewhere in that story that if he had seen the face of God, he would surely die. You yeah, know what I mean? yes. yeah. Yeah. And it's it, like it's like uh, there, there's a bit of there's a bit of poetry there. And that's all it is, is myth and poetry. Yes. But there's a bit of poetry there about like, if you were to see your true self, you would surely die, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. or, or, or recognize where God comes from, uh, you know, in, in the psyche and so sure. on.
Uh, there is something beautiful there, I think. Um, but uh, getting back to the shadow, like as you curve around that hall, around that bend, you can see the many different marks left along the way of this shadow. And that's how you may know its name. Almost like it, it almost is. like that, that person uh, ahead of you is like leaving a trail of breadcrumbs as well. Uh, yes. You know? yes. And that person ahead of you is the person, in a sense, the only way you can access him is what is behind you. What is behind both of you? Mm -hmm. uh, the story. Come, come to find out, you're the, the one with the leaky bag of breadcrumbs. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All these stories, and it's through these stories that you may uh, intuitively grasp uh, uh, whatever this uh, person is, and and you do deeply feel, you deeply feel in this in this place, in this hall, in this life, and and you feel quite deeply whenever things do go right or go wrong. And, and it's with this in mind, uh, your own fear and trembling, as well as exaltation and, and uh, sublimity or beautification, whatever, whatever words you would like to use here. All of the sentiments that you have are themselves what influence your decision making at this moment when you build the self in the future. Uh, you build stories that themselves um, you reflect construct well into the, you fit into your overarching narrative. Because... Somewhere deep inside, I'm sure you could fall into fall in for this, fall and fall and fall into this uh, sentiment I'm about to tell you. Uh, you know deep inside that you are a bug. You know, you're you're a real bug. You are you're you're real. You and I could look into that feeling like where you you're quite disgusting. You're quite a reprehensible fellow. You know, and you could really fall into that sentiment, that feeling, and and you can try to construct a narrative off of that. But in short. It's quite cathartic, so people certainly do that. But I, I mean to well, say that you, you do these narratives, and you can look back and create them based upon uh, past interaction. And I think I've kind of opened the door to a new conversation here as to whether or not you build good narratives. And I think part of building a bad narrative is that it's quite cathartic and quite quite delicious. I suppose I could say it's it's quite uh, revealing and quite uh, people actually enjoy these things sometimes. Th this is this is a good opportunity to come back to what. Uh, both of you trying to jump the gun, uh, you know what I mean? But we're at the hour mark. It's a perfect time. I definitely want to hear from uh, Bray, uh, you know, certainly a lot on this one. But so um, just to wrap up the authentic versus chameleon thing, dear listener, uh, it, it is it is my opinion, right? Just my opinion that you should be a more authentic self. And um and it's just because of my personal experience, right? Um, I, I've struggled a lot with being my authentic self. And, um, you know, and, and that kind of doesn't jive with, with what I said earlier about being my authentic self. I've never really lied to anybody, you know, substantially. I've only just not said information. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Lies of omission. And I didn't know to call them that until later in life, <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But honestly, it was a survival tool in, in, in the environment that I was raised in. Uh, a lie of omission is how, how I got by, mm -hmm. you know? And um, that's rationalization. That lie still hurt, you know? And uh, so on it goes. We, we, all, we all have our lies of omission. And um, maybe maybe it comes to a point where there's like a kind of breaking point. I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, but it certainly did for me. And um, I, for a, for an example, I, I've never I've never remotely heard of someone who was struggling with a facet of their personality uh, or, or biology even that did not you know uh, begin to explore and understand that part of themselves and regret it uh, i've never heard of a of a gay man or woman coming out and regretting it we shouldn't have to come out to, to begin with type right of idea. you know i like it's stupid it's stupid that that's even a practice but my point is is that in in my at least informed opinion um not expert but, you know uh being more authentic um, I've, I've never, I've never heard of someone who regretted it type of idea, but with that in mind, like I said, I want to hear from, from everybody on this one, but especially Bray, uh, cause he hasn't, he hasn't had a lot of opportunity. Um, can we choose who we are? And 
I want to hear from Bray as well, because we had a lot to say in the free will discussion. Mm -hmm. So as an example, just from my own personal experience, I, I, I don't, I don't think that I would be, um, as, uh, uh, I would, I would be more gullible. I would be more believing if my circumstances were different. And that's a very big part of my personality, I feel. Uh, like, I, you know, I, I, I really feel like I can smell bullshit a mile away, you know? And, and it's just because of the, like, the narcissist I was raised with, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. But, like, as well, if I didn't have the really negative experiences that I do, would, would I be as grown up as I am today? Do I still have a lot of growing up to do? Yes. But you guys get what I mean. I didn't choose to be born in this circumstance. So did I choose to be a, a very incredulous person? I don't know. What do you think, Ray? Um, say, say again, sorry, I was completing a thought in my head. You're good. Can, can you choose who you are? Can, can you, can you choose who you are? Yeah. You, can you, in other words, mm. um, can you choose to be this authentic self in the first place? That's what Trevor was saying earlier. Sure. Like, like, can, can you, can you identify the self to such a degree that you can choose who that self is or, or, or at least observe who it is? So I can only speak for my own experience, obviously. Um, but from my perspective, it feels as though I could in that I, you know, and this is without cracking in, uh, into the free will thing too much, you know, uh, with the determinism and, and am I really in control and all that, you know, we're, we're, we're assuming that we have the capability to actually fulfill our own or at least will our will and not just fulfill our will. Uh, but. I, I would say, yeah, um, like I was just saying, like you can make decisions and, and do things based on a uh, idealized or sought after um, state of being, even if you are not already in that, you know, it's, it's quite literally the uh, metaphysical uh, fake it till you make it uh, what we're all doing really. Um so so yeah um can 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 i choose to be the authentic self um i i'll, I'll say this though a authenticity is is very fragile very incredibly fragile um we are so easily influenced by things that i don't even think most people realize just how easily we are influenced like uh, Television stations, uh, uh, companies rather, two television stations pay ridiculous amounts of money just to show you something for thirty seconds, thirty seconds or less. Um, and well, you might like YouTube ads, you know? Right? Yeah, like you can literally skip a YouTube ad after a few seconds um, if you're lucky <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> um, but for that short sliver of time a company has paid a ridiculous amount of money for that to grace your eyes and millions of people just like you and you probably think nothing of it but truthfully it is changing how you view things this is how all the social media platforms operate you are at the microscopic level being influenced by everything that comes across your screen and you may not feel like it but you are and there's great media and documentaries about this out there. But my point just being that authenticity it really is fragile. Uh, watch Fight Club. Fight Club right. is is a movie about people with very fragile, <laughs> authentic selves who want to reject society uh, and basically uh, create this sense of individuality, this sense of authenticity for themselves away from you know, what they've been pressured to do or essentially forced to do. Um, however, in the process, they fuck it all up and end up creating a cult. Uh, and you don't have to look in fiction for this. It exists everywhere in the real world. Um, so, so yeah, uh, 
it, it very easily destroyed authenticity. But can you choose it for yourself? Can you make the right decisions to become what it is? And and obviously, I can't tell other people what their authentic self is. I know what I would like, um, or what I feel like I would like, uh, and I get satisfaction out of pursuing those things. So what other metric do I really have of measuring what I want to do authentically? So the same thing goes for you, listener, is, you know, only you uh, can know and cultivate this authentic self. Also, another lesson from Fight Club. Uh, So don't be, you know, persuaded by these things. It's why, as we've said many a times in the past on the show, uh, enveloping yourself with the scientific discipline is so important so that you may learn to discern the bullshit from the facts. Uh, it you will benefit you in the long run. Yes, will benefit you in the long run. I, I love how you said that. You said envelop yourself. Don't just learn it. Accept it. Yeah. You know what I mean? But Trevor, I mean, you know, like I said, I, I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting uh, you to resume your thoughts from earlier. But like, can you even observe the self that we're talking about? And can you choose for like what it looks like? Mm, what it looks like. This is a this is a very difficult series of questions. Uh, line. <laughs> the short answer is I don't know. Uh, that's that's the short answer. I, I'm afraid I don't. Um, it's it's one of those situations where I don't. I can see a lot of tendrils of ideas here. Uh, for example, when you say something along the lines of well, um, can you choose this self? That sort of thing. My first thought is, um, well, I certainly feel like I can. I certainly feel like I can. I can build, I can aggregate a whole bunch of uh, feelings together and, and create like this uh, this overarching uh, uh, bludgeon I can use on reality to which I can evaluate reality and then use. But at the same time, it does sometimes feel as if it's just something that is happening and it's something that I'm hovering over. As if- You feel like you're along for the ride. Yeah, yeah, as if I'm an experiential base, and then the universe is acting, and I am the existent- uh, the experiential base. A lot of this has to do with where you identify your selfhood and where you feel you are. It's really quite interesting, because uh, there are times where I look at reality, and I see as if I am hovering over, like I've just said, where all of reality is happening, and I'm uh, an observer. Uh, an observer, like not, it's not even about passive, uh, being a passive observer. I mean, that's a good, a good way to look at it. But it's, it's about quite literally being the, the, uh, the aura around uh, the, the, the sentimentality of, of this physical uh, thing in the universe, uh, the, the sentimentality of it, and that's what I am, and the rest of it is acting. Sometimes I feel that way, and then other times um, I've, I've come into and, and engaged with reality where I had these. Uh, I, uh, f- this sentiment, a very different sentiment, that the entire universe is in a sense uh, mine, in the same sense that it is yours, uh, listener. Uh, it, it you you realize that everything is itself just an abstraction happening within your mind state. At the very least, that's how that's the only way you can access it. And and in that sense, it's all deeply yours. Uh, and you feel this sentiment that I am like, I feel it, you feel almost a little bit like Atlas holding up the heavens. All of the heavens, all at once. You you feel immensely powerful in that moment, and it's when you find those two counterfactual sentiments, those two very very different feelings, that you realize that uh, that the short answer is I can't offer an answer to this question because it becomes a matter of just the way that I'm feeling about it at this moment. My overall a uh, feeling of what the self is 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 itself just an intuition based upon my current. Um, emotionality, my current sentiment, to which I then build an answer to this question. But it is itself uh, the buttress. It is the foundational, uh, uh, the foundation uh, of which I would then build any assertion to answer this question it is itself built uh, primarily on on the feeling I have at this moment, whether I feel as if an e- uh, I am an ether state, I'm, I am an aura around my physical self, or I am Atlas holding up the heavens. It, it, you can feel both things very thoroughly, and it's from that I can then offer assertions and, and arguments. But I, I don't quite know which one is actually valid. I don't. Right. I don't. And, and just like that, any, I, I'm not capable of offering substantive uh, answers. I'm, not, I'm, I'm quite frankly not sure where to go with them. All I can say is I, don't, I just don't know. 
So I would I would like to offer up um, something from Sam Harris. Uh, I was uh, on my way back from Illinois, and I started listening to his book Waking Up. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it seems like a good read so far, and I will admit that I have not finished it. But preliminarily, like you know, looking at it, you know, reading the text, so to speak, he he talks about doing um very illicit drugs okay <laughs> and, and then <laughs> and then he talks about how like that opened him up to the present moment and how later on he was able to access that again without drugs i suppose but my whole point in bringing this up is to, is to tell you okay like i'm not just fanboying over sam harris and you should go read his book or anything but I really liked his language about this, where he said something about how once you once you like end up in the present moment, your sense of self begins to drift away. Mm -hmm. And his exact words were something like, "You you realize that there is no self, and that it's a construct, and, and so on." And I really, really, really feel like there's a lot of truth to that. Certainly. Um, I've had very profound moments in life, as I'm sure you both have, as I'm sure that you listener have had. Uh, no matter no matter how young or, or old you are, you you've at least come close to this before, where you have a moment where you're you're thinking to yourself, that that person over there has a whole other story, and it's not mine, um, and and it's a hundred percent valid. Uh, I think, I think that there are some very judgmental people out there, me included. I, I am a very judging person, like like in the way of like psychologically or, or Myers Briggs test type of thing. I'm a very judge, not judgmental person, but judging. And I can say with confidence that I used to be judgmental, but I'm not any longer. Um, for example, if you're going down the road and you see a crackhead tweaking out. They they still have a whole ass story that you they're don't. They're not know. an NPC. Uh, yeah, they're not an NPC. Like that's that's one thing my students keep bringing up, and and I I feel like I come down with a hammer on it every single time. Um, you know they'll they'll start talking about people <clears throat> referring to them as NPCs, and I'm like, you must stop that. <laughs> at, at least not in my presence. I, you know I will not accept it. That they they are not NPCs; they're people, right? Um, you know, it, it's so it's so easy to get to give in to these like really solipsistic ideas about how like <laughs> you know, and it's a disease of the head. I mean, you know, it's it's where religion comes from. I swear. Um, hmm. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I I like what you said about the. Um... I don't know if the destruction of the self is really an appropriate way to put it, but I finished reading John Cowper Powis's in spite of uh, last week or week before. And one of the sure. themes that recurs through this book is um, he heavily advocates for destroying your sense of personality. Um, and that might be a harsh way of putting it, but what he means is that, you know, the sort of aspects of personality that lead you to this sort of conceit and uh, this sort of overt uh, individualism that is uh, way too too much um, and to live in the present and it, like utilize all your five senses to their maximum degree and just simply experience you know as purely as you possibly can and Very enjoy Harris. Yeah, enjoy it as much as you possibly can in spite of, you know, even even the bad things like you must just experience and enjoy um, life. And that's what it sounded like to me. I always thought that was particularly interesting. But of course, I, I would advocate for for a balance, because while we can um, have these moments of just pure sitting in, in, in the world and experiencing. Um, matter of fact, a clip came up on my phone um, the other day of some uh, Japanese term for simply like, 
you know, the practice of sitting, not speaking, not interacting, over, like overly interacting with anything else, but just being in uh, one in the world uh, and, and observing, just observing what's going on. And that's just quite literally exactly what he was uh, suggesting that, that we should do. But I'm also, you know, someone who recognizes how important a narrative is for for the human being. And uh, we cannot construct a narrative without a sense of time and without a present or a past and a future, uh, particularly the past, because this is where everything has been written already. Uh, and and on that, I, you know, I would say as we're getting close to the close here, somebody, um, I'm glad that I remembered this because this is somewhat related I was on the, uh, here we go. Here's a, you know, put a nickel in your jar for me mentioning cyberpunk again, but I was, uh, <laughs> going through Reddit <laughs> and, uh, some guy had posted on the cyberpunk Reddit, um, that he's been experiencing this sort of emotion and he can't really explain it well. Um, but it's like this, he says, it's this distinct longing for a life I know I will never live that doesn't exist yet in the real world. Um, there's probably some German or French term for it out there. Right. Most I think there were some yeah. people that mentioned these different, you know, terms, because uh, nostalgia is not quite the word because it, we, we have not lived it. It's, yeah. it's, it's this fictitious world, which we've discussed on the podcast before. It may not really be that fictitious. Um, <laughs> well, but if it's, yeah, if it's not, if it's not fictitious, then it therefore is nostalgia then, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, we we can't have necessarily. nostalgia for something that has not happened yet, which is this what but this it, guy but it is has describing. Happened. Well, if if we're talking about being in like a if I don't if I understand correctly, it's like being inside of like cyberpunk world. Let's say. Sure. Therefore, what I'm what I'm referencing yes. is like we can imagine a world in which we have sent astronauts to Mars. However, we have not done that, so we cannot be nostalgic for it. We because have we nostalgia have a, requires nostalgia a might not be the right word. A longing for a life that has not sure. yet happened. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yes, that's what the, this person is describing, <laughs> and they're saying, you know, well, I have all these great things. You know, I'm extremely lucky to have amazing life and family. Wouldn't trade it, but for some reason, I'm so drawn to this world, um, you know. And so I I first recognize like this sort of uh, almost parasocial relationship with this um, environment and this be like uh, this place. Um, and I I think that's one of the ways in which we try to recognize our person, like our authentic self is like something's drawing to me to this and I want more of this. Um, but I, I commented and I was like, we get these feelings also, but because of the narratives that are told, the stories that we experience. Um, and then I went on to be like, yeah, this shit's happening in real life. But what I <laughs> what was really important that I, I put on here was, um, you know, these are completely normal feelings. Uh, but again, you, OP, are like the author of your own life. Um, you are the person who's making the decisions. Um, and while most of these fictitious stories are usually far removed from reality, this one is a lot closer to home. And I was like, if this is a world that you don't want to see happen, um, then I, I, you know, I suggested that he get writing, <laughs> so to speak, mm -hmm. on, on said narrative and, you know, basically act in, a, in such a way that would fulfill this sort of, Yes. Emotional inner desire. Certainly. You're telling him to create. Uh to create is what you're telling him to do. It's right. You're asking him to make it make it out make it about. Make it make it such make it so. Uh, if you want to be Picard about it. But, yeah, but, yeah. but but the important <laughs> the important part yes. about it is that, you know, when we use the word create, we off, almost always think of some sort of artistic medium um for create and i and i don't intend that that's included but i don't intend to i mean to say it in a more um i don't know General. if metaphysical is the word i'm looking for but like create you like create you like you can be whatever you want to be um the, speaking of john calvert powis the dude was had a whole chapter on in spite of madness and this was written in 52 so a little bit different than what we might consider today but what my takeaway was that if you are living in like if like if you have just a completely different 
something going on inside your head. If you think that you are, he quite literally says the equivalent of, if you think you are, you know, Teddy Roosevelt reincarnated, then by God, you live that truth and you go, you go the whole nine yards with that. So long as you don't like involve other people in a negative way, or you don't like let society like destroy your sense of being because of something like that. Like he's like, you go be fucking crazy goblin mode at home and, uh, you know, live this experience because that is you, that is quite literally what is physically your brain state, um, at present. But he's like, but you've got to like reel it in, you know, whenever it's time to, to reel it in. Uh, and that's, that's all I mean to say is that if this is what you want, if this is what you feel, what you, your brain and your emotions are telling you that you want to live a narrative like you've seen in something before, like do it. Don't conform to society's one. And, you know, you got to go and get a job and then settle down, have some children and get a little like the fuck that do whatever the hell you want. Like it's your life. You've only got one and you're, we're all going to die eventually. So like, just do what you want. Craft you know what, your you know what own this reminds me of narrative. It's so straight up. Uh, it reminds me uh, again, and I, I believe it's George Martin, the, the author of you know mm-hmm. Song of Ice and Fire and so on. Uh, and, and he may have been paraphrasing some other ancient author or whatever, but he said, um, just briefly, he said that uh, the person who does not read lives one life. The person who does read lives many. Right. You know. And, and it's I, just think, a, I think that encapsulates yeah. what you're trying to say there. Well, it's, like if and, you want to go George, home and you want to act like, uh, yeah. uh, I, you know, I mentioned Moses earlier and now it's on my mind. The actor <laughs> for Moses in the really old Ten Commandments movie. Oh, yeah. It, it was said that when he came home, he was still Moses. I, you know, and, and like until that until they were done filming, he was Moses. Mm-hmm. You know, and like his wife would complain that that he's yeah. still fucking Moses. <laughs> like, like when he gets home, like I make him food, and he's Moses. We have sex, and he's Moses. So like, you know, and it's it's wrong. And, and uh, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking, like, you know, okay, does that mean that actors get to do something that we don't? <laughs> well, well, Stephen, and I'm well, I'm glad that you or Stephen, you, I'm glad you said that because uh, this is what we've discussed before. I believe it was the topic of what gives your life meaning that right. we discussed uh, Camus' absurd men and the, yep. the idea of the actor living these many lives, and uh, you know, to a degree, we're all these absurd men, and uh, we want to do certain things and so if this is what lines up with what you feel is authentic to you then then i tell people I, i'm go for it like do it like i, I i'm not even going to get into my that there's not enough time for yeah. me to talk about what i feel i would like to do but it's some weird combination of all these different it just yeah <laughs> well, i'm going to leave I mean, it at that i would like to hear from you do do you have any closing remarks for sure. us sure um, to close this one, uh, and then I will go to Bray. We can just go to Bray, but I, I will say, whenever we talk of the self, it does seem to dissolve in the end, and I, and I'm not sure quite how to identify it. And whenever something is, if there is a question that is pre, the pre-assertion is you know what the self is, in order to answer that question, the question itself becomes incredibly difficult to answer. It's it's one of those things where the self, like like what Sam Harris says, does in fact dissolve upon further investigation. And that might be the best way of looking at it. It might uh, be. In, in most circumstances. And I, I think that's what this comes down to. And with that, um, I pass it off. Ray, any closing remarks? I, I think I've said what needs to be said. My <laughs> most important message to anybody listening is that, again, you 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 are the author. If, if you have a, a feeling of, or a way or you know, you're particularly inspired. Inspiration is a hell of a thing. Um, it's another reason that I love the arts because when you go to a museum and you walk through or you, you watch a movie, you consume some sort of media, you play a video game, um, there are inevitably stories or something that will stick out to you 
can't really explain why some some things you may be able to but usually it, it just feels intuitive there's something that sticks with you and inspires you and it is those things that end up creating who you are and if they inspire you in such a way that you feel that you are like i want to be like that then do it like just just do <laughs> just it. do it like <laughs> i you know do not do not feel pressured by these these endless barrage of of social pressures of societal pressures of corporate pressures to Head live speaking some so, yeah some yeah some other narrative that has nothing to do with what you want like i literally tell my mother all the time i'm like listen get ready cuz i might be living in like a dirt shack in the hills of some you know who knows where whatever just playing minecraft in real life because that's just one of the things that like has struck me in such a way that i'm like this seems like such a peaceful life and then in others i'm like i want to you know go tear up a bunch of shit and be a rock star and all these other you know like i there's so many different things and I, you know, I, I'm not the most motivated person, but when I am motivated, I'm doing stuff to fulfill these things. And I have never felt more authentic when doing them. So with that, peace, love, unity and respect and goodbye, America. <laughs> <laughs> My cat's looking end. at me like he's starving. So oh, I'll, uh, I'll close this up by saying, of course, you must take care of yourself. All right, you know what I mean? Yes. And uh, now, all things considered, Trevor's turn to say, you know, we've been saying it a long time, but, you know, we can't identify what the self is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, seriously. Um, I, I, will, I will close with this. If there's anything apparent about what we've talked about today, drawing from more information than just us three small shitheeds, you know, sitting at this... <laughs> you know, proverbial table. Yep. Um, people, you you are whoever you are right now. Okay. Um we we have to live in a more present mind frame. We have to resist the psychopathy of what Bray was talking about earlier, about being too individual. You can be too individual. I've had to come to realize that. Um and I can say that with certainty nowadays. Um, you can be too unindividual. It, it, you know, it's truly, you can be too altruistic, but you can be too egotistical. And you have to learn almost when to do either. Um, perhaps it should be said that you should be altruistic with your neighbor, but egotistical with, with something else. So, once again, you, you are who you are right now. And there's, there's very little you can do about that. And if you feel like you aren't who you want to be, it's as Bray says, you know, try and become who you want to be. Become an actor in this way that you, that you would like. And try it on, especially if you're young. I, I you know, <clears throat> as a teacher, uh, I've, I've done a lot of psychology homework uh, in this realm. And, and we, we discuss all the time how, you know, these teenagers are literally trying on different personalities to see how they fit. And that's a good thing. Do not discourage it. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've, uh, seen it discouraged and it's like, what do you hope to accomplish? I mean, you know, except to make a factory worker that has no place in our current society. I, you know, um, no, we should encourage people to try on different aspects and to see what fits the best. All right? So once again, take care of yourself. And with that, we say, have a good day.